purposes. Now, the church has endured some rough times, some intense times, and some catastrophic times. And the followers of Jesus has overcome the marginalization and the oppression and the persecution of, that happens in Babylon. Disciples have overcome the beast and the false prophet by standing firm in the faith and not being swayed into recanting. And those who have bent their knee to the Lordship of Christ has defeated the dragon by continuing to bring the kingdom. The second coming has occurred. And the saints who have died have been resurrected. The evil trinity, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, well, along with the kings of the world and all those who align themselves with the lies, allowing egoism to rule their lives, they have all been removed from the scene. Death and Hades, having finished their work, have no place in the new order. Everything in the old order is swept away to make room for the, the new that God is bringing. Now, the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated with His incarnation is consummated. And John tells us what he sees as the culmination of Jesus' ministry. So let's take a look. Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw heaven and earth new created. Gone the first heaven, gone the first earth, gone the sea. And I saw holy Jerusalem, newly created, descending resplendent out of heaven, as ready for God as a bride for her husband. And I heard a voice thunder from the throne, Look! Look! God has moved into the neighborhood making his home with men and women. <coughs> they are his people, and he is their God. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. Death is gone for good. Tears gone. Crying gone. Pain gone. All the first order of things gone. And the throne continued. Look, I'm making everything new. Write it all down. Each word dependable and accurate. And then he said, it happened. I am A to Z, the beginning. I am the conclusion. From the water of life well, I give freely to the thirsty. Conquerors inherit all this. And I'll be God to them. They'll be my sons and daughters to me. No, but the rest, the feckless and the faithless, the degenerates and the murderers, the sex peddlers and sorcerers, idolaters and liars... For them, it's like fire and brimstone. Second death. Well, along the way, we have noted the special place that numbers have in the Revelation. And, and verse 1 starts with, I saw. I saw. You know, this is the seventh time John proclaims, I saw. Yes, yeah, you see, beginning in chapter 19, verse 11, I saw. The one that follows in, in, in verse 2 is, is actually part of verse 1 that we just read. So what we have here is another series of seven, seven visions of perfection. I mean, first one, John sees heaven open wide and Jesus riding on a white horse. And then John sees an angel calling the birds to the great supper of God. And then John sees the beast and the false prophet captured. And then John sees an angel imprisoning the dragon. And then John sees the resurrected saints. And then John sees the great white throne judgment. And with chapter 21, John sees the consummation of the kingdom. It's the vision of the end. The seventh event is complete. I love this part of Revelation. That God is making a new heaven and a new earth isn't a new idea in Scripture. Okay, the prophet Isaiah has a very similar vision when he writes, pay close attention. And this is he speaking for God. I'm creating new heaven and a new earth. And all the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I am creating. And all I can say is, bring it, Lord. Bring it. You know, basically what we have here is a reiteration of this ageless hope. Now, I don't want to upset any surfers or deep sea fishermen, or fisher persons. 
uh, humans who like to catch fish from the ocean. Now, don't take that in the new earth that there will be no sea to mean that there is no sea. Okay, again, we've got to understand the use of the sea from its of the old order to mean its association with the sea in the Old Testament. Now, yes, sometimes good comes out of the ocean, but other times, most often, the sea is a source of the evil forces, very much like the abyss that we've read about. In fact, in Daniel 7, the sea is also the people who have aligned themselves with the beast. See, what John is telling us is not that there's not going to be any more waves at the beach. He's saying that in the new heaven and the new earth, there is no longer any opposition to God's rule or against His people. You see, that all this is gone has got to be the consequences of the human predicament removed. The old was tainted by sin and suffering, but the new is free from what was. The new heaven and the new earth. Excuse me. Silence your phone when you're in church. The new heaven and the new earth are once again as God originally designed them to be. Babylon, that's replaced with holy Jerusalem. And holy Jerusalem is a, a culture of holiness and godliness and righteousness. New Jerusalem descends out of a new heavens. You know, there's this false impression in the church that believers' final destination is heaven. But that's not the hope that's held out in the scripture. I mean, come on, don't we pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven? See, resurrected humanity will live on the new earth. The city is resplendent, beautiful, full of light, streets of peace. But before we run too far and imagine walking on streets of gold, living in a mansion just over the hilltop, as if we were actually describing an actual city, you need to remember that New Jerusalem is also the bride of the Lamb. And as the bride, the people of God. So the people of God are the city of God. In that letter to the Hebrews, we read, By an act of faith, Abraham said yes to God's call to travel to an unknown place that would become his home. And he left. He had no idea where he was going. By an act of faith, he lived in a country promised to him, lived as a stranger camping in tents. Isaac and Jacob did the same, living under the same promise. Abraham did it by keeping his eye on an unseen city with a real eternal foundation, the city designed and built by God. I mean, can you see the parallel between Adam's life and yours? God called you, you responded, and even though you didn't know, have any idea where you were going or what you were called to do, you left. In this world, in this Babylon, you haven't made it your home. And instead, you've kept your eye on the prize, looking forward to your real home in New Jerusalem. And not only does John see, John also hears. He hears another thundering proclamation from the throne, that place of authority. It, new Jerusalem is descending from this new heaven upon this new earth, and God is coming with it. It's the promise of the Old Testament prophets. I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is being realized in the consummation of the kingdom. God is with us. And John sees the fulfillment of all the covenant promises. And my friends, this is huge. It is face-to-face -face fellowship with God. It is faith becoming sight. You see, what God did in Jesus 
coming to an unknowing world and an unwelcoming people. He's now doing on a cosmic scale, but to a place that welcomes. The Apostle Paul told the Ephesians that this was God's long-range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in Him, everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet Earth. Ephesians 1.10 now, as God makes His dwelling place amongst His people, four things are abolished. Tears, pain, suffering, and death. They can't exist in the new creation. Tears and pain and suffering and death, they belong to, to, to what the faithful have already endured as they patiently waited for God to bring all things to His desired conclusion. Have you not suffered those four things in your life? You know, I think we get a glimpse of this from he Helen Lamell's hymn. We used to sing hymns in the church. Good theology in hymns a lot of times. Her song is titled, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And it says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, and when you look full on His wonderful face, the things of earth grow strangely dim. Now recall Romans 8.18 what we will have in the new heaven and new earth, Paul writes, isn't even worth comparing to the tears, pain, suffering, and death experienced in the old order. What a hope we have. What a hope we have in the consummation of the kingdom. The rough and tense and catastrophic times are going to become dim memories that can no longer harm us and hurt us and cause us consternation and pain. You know, many years ago when I first read that God is going to wipe away my tears, I thought of my mom. Do you have that experience as a young child that you fell or you scraped your knee, that elbow bumped your head hard? And mom came at the sound of your cries and she held you in your, her arms. And if you were lucky, she kissed your boo-boo. And if you were not so lucky, it was mercurochrome. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Still, she would wipe away your tears, comforting you, telling you that the worst is over and that everything is going to be all right. And I can imagine God taking all my tears from every sorrow, every injury, physical, spiritual, emotional, and doing the same thing. It's okay. Everything is going to be all right. Oh, bring it, Lord. I want that today. I want it now. Verse 5, that thundering, that thundering voice. Remember, thunder in the Revelation is a code word for you better pay close attention. And that thundering voice says, I am making everything new. Don't think that God is discarding the old as a failed experiment and starting all over. Some people have that. Oh, this didn't work. Let's try something else. It's not. No, God is not making new things. He's making what He has created new. And God seems to be in the habit of doing new things to bring about the restoration of His creation. And in this instance, the new is not like buying a new pair of jeans to replace the old ones. It's, it's more like the old pair being made brand new. That's amazing. Romans 8, 18 and 21. That's why I don't think there's any comparison between the present hard times and the coming good times. The created world itself could hardly wait for what's coming next. Everything in creation is being more or less held back. God brings it in until both creation and all the creatures are ready and can be released at the same moment into the glorious times ahead. Meanwhile, and we're in the meanwhile, have that joyful anticipation and let it deepen and here in this chapter here in the end it has happened God thunders his purposes have been realized creation again 
Like the garden in Eden, humanity walking with God in the cool of the evening and no snakes anywhere to be found. It's done. It's finished. Now, once again, John distorts time with God inviting the thirsty to come drink. See, those who have bent the knee to the Lordship of Christ have drunk and are drinking the water of life. But thirst... Do you thirst for the kingdom? Do you thirst for a closer relationship with God, to know Him more intimately, to experience His presence, to live according to His ways right now? Do you thirst for kingdom values, the principles of justice and love and peace and righteousness, ruling the hearts of people everywhere? Do you thirst for the transformation of all things being made new. <laughs> Thirsting for the kingdom is having an intense desire for God to consummate the kingdom. Live that bring it, Lord, in your heart of hearts, knowing what awaits is glorious. Now, is this just not another invitation to come to Christ? My friends, it is. It really is. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that you are a sinner in need of salvation, that you have been separated from God. Believe that Jesus is the reconciler of relationships and because of His sacrifice, atones for your sins so that He can present you to God pure, blameless, and holy. Commit yourself to Jesus. Be one of His disciples. Learn to destroy Babylon within and learn how to live as a citizen of New Jerusalem. And then simply ask God. Simply ask. Ask God to give you the water of life. Friends, it is a thirst quencher. It is. Consider the scripture. They defeated the dragon through the blood of the lamb and the bold word of their testimony. They weren't in love with themselves. They were willing to die for Christ. <laughs> Be willing to die for Christ. See, the conquerors, they get to live under the new heaven and upon the new earth and in new Jerusalem. This is their inheritance. This is your inheritance. Everyone who has bent their knee to the Lordship of Christ and have remained faithful, this is for you. This is what is coming. In verse 8, again with that time distortion, we get this list of behaviors that are common among the conquered. Not the conquerors, the conquered. John has written out a list of vices. And even though the list addresses concrete behaviors, they also are meant for you to look beyond the words to a more spiritual meaning, their general application. Well, in Revelation 9, 20 through 21, there was a list. And that list included idolatry, murder, magic, sexual immorality, and theft. Those are all deeds that have a fiery end. Here in verse 8, it's cowardice, faithlessness, abominations, idolatry, murder, magic, sexual immorality, and liars will all meet with a bad end. Later in chapter 22, verse 15, another list, and this list includes idolatry, murder, magic, sexual immorality, and liars. <laughs> As you know, and it should be firmly implanted in your mind, what you do matters. It matters. So here again is another temporal anomaly that, that's a warning. Such believers are, uh, such behaviors give believers a warning sign that they're headed for a swim in Lake Fire and Brimstone. So, if any of that is in your life, 
Any of it at all. It's like a hangover from living in Babylon. Change your ways while you can. Change your ways. See, there's no place under the new heavens or on the new earth or in New Jerusalem for the perpetrators of such deeds. There's no place. So John is giving you another opportunity to choose between life and death. <laughs> choose wisely, grasshopper. John is revealing the end. Or you might think of it as a new beginning. The consummation of the kingdom. The work that Jesus started with His incarnation and now concludes with His second coming. Anything that would hinder holiness and righteousness is gone. Even the angel of death has no place in the new order. Now, there's this folk theology, uh, a notion that you can dispel. My friends, the final destiny for believers is not harps on clouds in heaven. Believers can look forward to bodily existence in the world, in a world, the way that God created it to be. That glorified body, that resurrected body, will not be subject to disease or decay. I hope it's about 30 years old. 33. That's about when Jesus left the earth. I'd like to have my 33-year-old body back. Strong, healthy, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound instead of having a hard time operating the drinking fountain. I imagine that harmony with the earth will be restored. There will be in the hearts of all peace and goodwill. Best of all, God will be with us and we'll see Him face to face. That's glory. That's glory. Can I ask you this morning which eternity you're running towards? Which path are you on? Are you on a kingdom path or a lake of fire and brimstone path? Right now, you have an opportunity to choose. Right now, you can make sure that you're on the right path. Just ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, show me if I'm on the right path. Show me what needs to be changed. Shh, let me partner with you to make the changes necessary so that I can live in New Jerusalem. Would you do that? Do that. Do it.